We're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and we are in the studio live talking with Claudio Popa. And Claudio actually is Acknowledge Flow Cyber Safety Foundation. <laughs> All right, that's not actually uh, that's what good. he that's, is, that's but good. that's who he is. That's what he works well, for. Well, I, I mean, I, I represent the Knowledge Flow Cyber Safety Foundation. Um, we go into schools, we partner with municipalities to teach kids to teach seniors, to teach families about cyber safety, about staying safe online without mm-hmm. scaring the bejesus out of them. Uh, so it's that's tricky. that's a that's a big deal because uh, we talked about this before the break. Mm-hmm. We talked about why, right? It's important to for people to know why they should do something. Everyone understands passwords stronger. Yeah. Uh, use a password. Don't not use a password. Uh, don't click on stuff. But eventually you're doing all this stuff and you're you lose track of why you're doing it so i have to lead with why it's important to do it Mm -hmm. and also i have to lead with the fact that you don't have to act out of fear you have to act out of caution and caution is important right right? because you don't want to overdo the security bit either you don't want to come up with three thousand character passwords uh that'll that'll break the website you're trying to put them into so (laughs) um so there's a there's a balance there, mm-hmm. but the balance is not there to be uh, bypassed, right? So if you see a security question, you should not avoid it. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't make it trivial. You shouldn't leave it blank. Um, <laughs> um, no comment is not really a good <laughs> yeah. Answer. So so it, it's it's I think it's really up to today's businesses and government agencies to explain the why. Why is it important? There should be a little question mark bubble beside each security question to say this is why this is important. Um, I think during my CBC interviews last week, I also mentioned that um, there are password recovery questions and security questions that you have to be careful with. Uh, uh-huh. When you're setting up an account, when you're setting really? up an account, you're setting up your, you know, you're giving them your unique identifier. There's your email going out the window, right, right there, which is yeah. fine. You're providing your your some way of communicating. Uh, you're selecting a password, and sometimes you've got those annoying password strength meters that you have to punch in oh, yeah. increasingly strong passwords until you've essentially forgotten what you just punched in because yep. you're worried about putting a a period and an exclamation uh, mark and hashtags extra and all the characters. Rest. Oh, good grief! But yeah. then they go on and they say, "Well, we got to ask you these three security questions just in case you lose your account. What's your mother's maiden name? Names. What school did yep. you go to? What was your first car?" Those are eroding (coughs) those are eroding your security uh with each of those questions you are increasing the risk that someone will break into your account really so so they're doing the opposite of what they seem to be doing yeah so last year you may recall that there was a massive uh we may even have talked about this that banking uh breach with what was it cibc bmo yep um they had purchased a piece of software from a company uh which was loblaws as i recall um anyway loblaws bank was folding and they they sold it to one of these banks and and these banks didn't necessarily uh do their proper due diligence from a security perspective and the software allowed people to say hey no you know what i've forgotten my password and then they would be presented with the security questions which they would get wrong (laughs) <laughs> but when they got wrong, they got them wrong, the system still allowed them into the account partially. So they were wow. half authenticated into the account, just enough to see information from the people's financial banking uh account so that's how those 90,000 usernames were were compromised Uh, there was an issue with the way the software recognized them as being legitimate um, legitimate users Um, but let's assume for 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 just a second that a company has implemented the right way to recognize people based on these security questions right those security questions oftentimes are trivial and you can find that information on social media um, you can find, you can, there's software out there that I or anyone else can use to create a genealogical tree, 
for individuals based on their connections online. And so you can figure out who's related to whom. And those, let's say those maiden names may come up once in a while. Or you may have posted a picture of your car or your dog uh, okay. or your dog's birth date or things of that nature. Those are things that can be done using uh, research. It's called open source intelligence or OSINT. Attackers are used to wow. doing this. There are special tools that save a lot of time. You think that it, it might be a pain to, to look in a million different places online, but there are tools out there that will streamline this process. So recommendation, ignore security questions and password recovery <coughs> questions. And, okay. in, and in fact, make those passwords in and of themselves. Make them unique. Uh, ask your password database to come up with some sort of an alphanumeric string and punch it in there. That way you'll have something completely different from what the question's asking. And you can store those in your password database. That's okay. what I do. Okay. Uh, that's that's my recommendation. You can't you can't leave them blank because the system won't let you leave them <coughs> excuse me. Leave them blank. Uh, and you can't really answer the right answer the question correctly because that exposes you. So <coughs> the only alternative is to make something up and keep track of it. Don't forget what you right, made up. Right, don't forget what you put so down there. So again, these are things that password databases make very easy to do, right. to, just to remember this, this information that you may never need to remember again, but if you do, it'll be in there. <coughs> Jay, um, we're going to take just a quick break, and when we come back, we'll continue our topic, and this time, e-transfers. All right. Claudio here with KnowledgeFlow.ca. If your family has been the victim of cybercrime, cyberbullying, or malicious privacy abuses, you're not alone. It's happening every day and sometimes carries tragic consequences, as we've seen in recent news. What's the solution? Don't internalize it. If it's an urgent issue, call the police immediately. If, however, you would like professional advice, you can confidentially email report at knowledgeflow.ca and get some ideas for dealing with social media, instant messaging, webcams, hacking, identity breaches, etc. Remember to visit knowledgeflow.ca on Facebook and potentially arrange a seminar for your community center, your school, or your board of education. Hi folks, Kim Mitchell here. You know, however you choose to get around your ATV, your snowmobile, your boat, car, if you have a motorcycle, all these things take 100% of your attention and skill to operate safely. Alcohol impairs that and bad things can happen. So be smart, okay? You know what I'm going to say next. This message brought to you from the Safe and Sober Awareness Committee. And we're back on Fresh Waves. We're talking with Claudio Popa about cybersecurity and how to keep your stuff safe. So now, a lot of our listening audience today is small business owners. They they have a little business. They do, you know, yoga studios and all these sorts of things. And they they're not massive corporations they're not going to be able to afford some massive security system and most of their money is taken by e-transfer i mean people seem to be terrified of walking around with large amounts of cash in their pocket but it seems like they're not so worried about it when they're dealing with what they consider to be large amounts of cash in an e-transfer situation so we know that um in a recent CBC article about a woman who had her e-transfer stolen, we can do a little bit of putting the onus on the victim because she did have a really weak password. And of course, if you get four tries and her question was, what's my favorite beetle? And there's only four of them. You figure that <laughs> the person has a 100% chance of getting it right. So it's a weak password. It's a weak clue. How do you keep this stuff safe? Because it really is an issue. So I, I'm i not sure how weak the password was, but we do know that the password was shared across a number of sites. And uh, last now, time... How does it get shared across a number of sites? Oh, she just well, sent it to her girlfriend, didn't she? Excellent question, Bren. <laughs> the, 
the way this happens is if you register to one site and then you register to a second site with the same password, oh, yeah. anyone who breaks the password on either one of those sites will try it on the other and realize that they have just logged in as you. Therefore, they're impersonating you. Mm. So then they get control over your site. We may or may not have talked about this today. But um, <laughs> as um, uh, so, so we call that credential stuffing. And that's another reason why you need a password database so that you don't have an excuse for reusing for for using different different passwords. Um, so that's one issue. Uh, the other issue is that the websites that uh, she had registered on were trusted with more than just her identity information. They also exposed her passwords. And that's a big deal because anytime you go to a password uh, protected site, that site's responsibility is to encrypt your password. So if it ever gets stolen, all the bad guys are getting is encrypted, jumbled, garbled information. Mm -hmm. But many websites don't encrypt it properly and they store those passwords in the clear. That means non-encrypted. So somewhere on the network, there may be a file that stores your password in the clear. And that is something that you can't really know for sure when you're registering for uh, a new account. Mm -hmm. Another reason why you should use different passwords on different sites, because if it gets broken, that's the only site they can get into. So <clears throat> with, with respect to the, the kind of um, interact or e-payment, e-transfers e yeah. that, that we were talking <clears throat> about, there's a number of layers of protection. One is your bank account, which uses a username and password and ideally a second factor. And the <laughs> other is, yeah, very rarely uh, is it enabled. Um, and in some cases, there's an additional code that you have to put in mm -hmm. for each and every transfer or for each and every recipient. Uh, but most people don't realize that once they've lost control over their bank account, anyone can go in there and change your recipients. So they can set themselves up as a recipient. They can, you know, punch in somebody else's account or they can look at the accounts that you've already got in there and see if they can break into them. Uh, so in this particular case, I believe the attacker had control over both accounts. Uh, yeah. The recipient was compromised and obviously the sender was compromised as well. Um, I so it's it's an interesting situation that uh, that transpired because Canadians in general have become a little bit complacent. I'm not saying this this lady was or it has anything to do with this particular situation, but in general, Canadians are often assured that the bank or the credit card company will take care of anything that might happen. So we've all seen credit card uh, breaches and unauthorized transfers and payments and so on get reversed just by virtue of calling and saying, yeah. hey, you know what? I've got these <clears throat> these unknown charges. So or you get used to that. someone took my e-transfer that wasn't my friend. That's the right. money's been taken, the, but yeah, my friend right. doesn't have it. So unauthorized financial transfers have taken place before and every other time they were covered by the bank or the credit card company. So it's a bit of a departure from that policy to suddenly hear that a Canadian bank has said no to covering the losses uh, from a fraudulent uh, transaction. It's a problem. It's also a problem because what do you do? You take it to the police, but the police is dealing with massive frauds. They're dealing with investigations that are in the millions. They don't want to necessarily Deal allocate... Deal $870 from right. <laughs> Betty Lou's account. Yeah, or even anything under 500000 or even a million. So I, was, I spoke at a conference last week, and, and they were lamenting the fact that anything under a million flies under the radar because there are some such massive levels of fraud and money laundering going on in Canada. And there's so many, uh, so many different malicious and criminal activities that are going on with a very limited number or amount of police and law enforcement resources allocated to, to dealing with them. So it's always, they're always playing catch up. So they don't have the bandwidth to deal with, you know, 800 bucks. Yeah. 
so I think, uh, if anything, the bank may have decided to to say, you know what, we can't handle these things indefinitely. At the end of the day, users need to be responsible for the way they care for their individual identities and for their passwords. We live in different times than we did 15 years ago, and we can't indefinitely accept responsibility for these. But it, it, it does seem like a departure from that kind of policy. Mm -hmm. And that's speaking from a superficial perspective. I don't know the details of, right. that, uh, of that response that they got from the bank. But it's interesting, one of the people who I was speaking with yesterday, a listener of ours who will be listening today, um, she said, oh, come on, you don't really need it. It's, that was just a mistake because she asked, you know, the beetle question, and there's only four beetles. If she had a better password, it never would have happened. People don't have the time or care who she is and the time to find their passwords. And I said, but hang on a second. These people are making their living out of ripping people off. They have all the time in the world. This mm. is what they do for a living. The same as you're putting in a 10-hour day, they're putting in a 10-hour day as well. <laughs> These are hardworking people who know yeah. what they're doing, and they're using technology to increase their productivity. Right. So they're very efficient in, in what they do. Um, there's also something to be said for the different ways that this could have happened. So, for example, you can create a new recipient. You can modify an existing recipient. You can intercept what what transfer password was was punched in um, the user themselves uh, the users themselves tend to compromise the process by emailing each other the password uh, instead of discussing it over the phone for example would a text be more secure than a text would be more secure, more secure because than using because it's the on email a, address yeah. right which you already know that yeah is compromised. exactly if the email address is compromised then usually when email addresses are compromised they're compromised for years and years because when was the last time you changed your email password um or your e email address even or your email address which is you know part of your identity but most people don't change their passwords to their email why because they're those uh, those email addresses are checked by your computer and they're checked by your phone and any number of devices will stop working if you change the password suddenly. Um, so most people don't do it unless they have to. And I actually recommend that you do not, that you not do it unless you have to. Don't be changing passwords willy-nilly. Um, those are best practices, to not randomly change passwords, to change them when you have to. Otherwise, oh, really? yeah. Otherwise, like just don't go in and do maintenance and say, ah, today I'm going to make that's new right. passwords. That's right. Yeah, for there's everything. there's no such thing as password change day. Uh, <laughs> don't don't be doing that um, because if you're already compromised on password change day, then all of those new passwords will be stolen all at once, and that's not a great idea. So you change them when you have to. When there's a big data breach and you receive an email that says. We are from such and such a company. We regret to inform you that, that there yep. was an attacker, and uh, you know they've they've stolen the accounts. But we don't have any evidence that anything bad has happened as a result of it. They always have to say this. Yes, they always to, do say to that to protect their brand and their good name. Uh, and we're doing everything we can, and we've signed you up to a credit monitoring service for a year, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's when you should change your your password. But if that account required not just a password but a second factor then you should be feeling pretty good because if that password was stolen that password is useless without your second factor no one can impersonate you if you use a second factor uh, when you log in so okay uh yeah two-factor authentication very useful thing love it love it now can you do that with e-transfer Though, but I guess the e transfer thing is not just the fact that someone randomly guessed the password. The, the whole part of this is the fact that somebody had already compromised that email address. Like they'd That's already right. had that, that identity account. was yeah. compromised, and the e transfer feature was created with the assumption that it's nestled within a bigger account. So that is a feature of your bigger bank account. You can do right. all kinds of things inside your bank account, including transferring uh, uh, money. And the people who created it basically said, look, we don't have to worry too much about security because it's the bank that is providing the security. Anytime someone logs into their uh, bank account, ostensibly there's sufficient security at work to uniquely identify that individual mm -hmm. as the correct person who owns this account. So 
Uh, so they just focused on creating a way to transfer money as easily as possible. Um, and they added that, you know, that password feature. I, I can't remember what they call it, but anyway, it's some sort of a phrase that you have to enter mm -hmm. so that you can facilitate that transfer. Uh, it's basically a shared secret is what it is. Both the sender and the recipient need to know this. And, uh, and of course, you have to transfer that between the sender and the recipient in a secure way. And the best way to do it is verbally over the phone uh, so right. that it's not in writing anywhere anywhere where it can be it can be stolen or key logged using a key logger like we we discussed. So there you go. All right. So if we have to sum up the last hour, mm -hmm. we're basically going to be telling people that um, they need to have some sort of a system to keep their passwords. And I'm going to let you summarize it because I'm a moron when it comes to this kind of stuff. I'm learning by the day. I remember when someone said to me years ago, putting anything online, even joining Facebook, is like standing naked in the mall. If you take all your clothes off and stand naked in the mall, then have at it. Otherwise, there's no such thing as privacy online. Mm -hmm. So um, judging by that, give us the the top three key points that we've been discussing in the last hour. Well, you mentioned the, um, uh, the knowledge flow, cyber safety. Uh, when, you, when you mentioned it last time, um, the cyber safety seminars are a great place to find this out, by the way. Okay. Just a, and that's a, a series a, at the library? That's a quick plug for the Richard Stovall Public Library, which will be hosting this seminar, in particular this one for seniors and for families about scams mm -hmm. on July 17th. Um, th the simplest security tips are usually the most important. And that's why I think you correctly took the time to discuss these things today. Um, I think that was very useful. And and really, it's important to realize that password management is not rocket science. It Literally, you choose a long password, not one that is complex or so complex that you can't remember it, but one that is nice and long, and it actually rolls off your fingers as you're typing it because it's essentially a phrase. So it makes sense to have a sentence as your password. You can Do you have put commas and stuff in the sentence? You can use punctuation. Right, like you're but not normally, spaces. You can use spaces. Spaces can are you? great for passwords. Really? Absolutely. I, I love putting were, spaces in there. I thought they weren't supposed to have spaces. Oh no, no, they're okay. Yeah, my my passwords will often have spaces. They'll have all sorts of punctuation. I mean, you can infinitely uh, customize them. Right. But you don't need to make them something alien looking. <laughs> right? Like it does. There's no. Protection. Yeah, some there. of these websites will give you an example of what a good yeah password is, and I look at it and think that's ridiculous. That's great for a robot. Yes, um, and this <laughs> and is, then you have to check off the box that says I am not a robot. That's right. <laughs> and and you sit there half an hour later, they're still showing you pictures of crosswalks. <laughs> yes, and you're trying to identify buses in these and squares backward and, L's and, and things like on, this. Yeah, we're not quite sure you're human. Um, so long passwords. Yep. Uh, those passwords need to be stored somewhere. Why? Because you need to have unique passwords. Okay. So every site, different password or passphrase, okay. I should say. And of course, uh, choose a password database that you trust and go with it. Make sure you make copies of that password database if it's not already in the cloud, like LastPass or 1Password. Um, and, and, and remember to distrust security questions and password recovery questions whenever you see those being asked on a on a site make sure you don't give them the information they're looking for give them something almost random that you keep track of in your password database one because you'll never hopefully need to use those password recovery mm -hmm. questions and two because they don't need to know what your mother's maiden name was no, they don't. Isn't right. that interesting? And when that site gets breached, all that information will become public, do public domain and everyone will know it. So these are, yeah, these are important advice. things that you need to remember. Always assume that a website will be hacked at some point. There's mm -hmm. no reason for them to not be hacked. Right. Right. Whether it's, it's a bank uh, website or a social media site, there's no reason for them to not get hacked in the future. So what you're doing is you're simply giving them enough information to identify you sufficiently 
uh, so that you can use their services. Um, okay. There's no reason for you to punch in your, your password, uh, your, your passport number, I should say, or mm-hmm. your driver's license or anything that is an identifier that cannot be changed on your end. That's the other and final tip. Don't be punching in. Don't be using social insurance numbers. Don't surrender social insurance numbers. Uh, those are identity elements that cannot be changed or can very it can be changed with great difficulty on your end. And so don't expense create too. And expense, yeah. So don't create that extra workload for yourself. And that's all I've got to say for you. Uh, today. There you go. Yeah, well, thank is, you so much for coming in. I know you're incredibly busy, yeah. and you know. I don't know how we, we have to have a show that talks about how you ended up getting into this field. Oh, because you know what? A story it's a in great, itself. I'm yeah. sure it is. And you know what? It's a it's an interesting field to be in, a great field to be in, mm-hmm. and a field that is going to be constantly growing and changing. So I'm really happy that you took the time to come to us today. My because pleasure. I know yeah, that it's been great. Know, in the realm of things, we are we are less than that five hundred thousand dollar or million dollar mark. We're just the little guys in the community. But you know, if somebody's hacking into everybody's system, uh, all it takes is a whole bunch of eight hundred dollar transactions to add up before they're making seriously mm-hmm. great money at everybody else's expense. So it, it pays right. to have a little bit of knowledge and to be as secure as you possibly can. Don't necessarily count on the banks watching out for you or right. law enforcement watching out for you. Just right. You got to watch out for yourself. All right. Thank you so much, Claudio. My pleasure. Well, that wraps it up for us today here on Fresh Waves. Um, We'll be back again next week, and next week we'll be talking spring fashion. So there you go. Uh, Have a great day, everybody. (laughs) Stay safe and go about changing your passwords or at least thinking up something that might be a little bit more uniquely you. You've been listening to Fresh Waves, a Whistle FM production. Catch you next time been listening to Fresh Waves, a Whistle FM production. I'm your host, Brenda Masson, and our technical producer is Jason Rumball. Tune in every Wednesday at 10 a.m. for Fresh Waves here on Whistle FM, 102.9 on the FM dial and whistlefm.com anywhere in the world. Fresh Waves is available on podcast too. Just go to whistlefm.ca or freshwaves.ca. We podcast all of the Fresh Waves shows so that you can listen at your leisure. Fresh Waves, it really is fresh.